Well, thank you very much for coming along to listen to me this morning. I am going to do something that isn't quite my normal, and that's just talk for half an hour just for the purposes of the forum. Um, so that that can be recorded, and then I'm hoping we can have a much more informal, um, really good critical debate about how to practically implement some of this stuff into your everyday work, if you so wish to. So, as um, Deirdre said, my name is Sarah, and I'm the, the co-director of the Combined Honours Centre at Newcastle University currently. Um, we, we manage a large degree programme together, and although Deirdre said, you know, Sarah has done these things. Actually, it's a team. We, I can't do any of this on my own, and I do it as part of a smaller, a small team. And within a university context, that can be quite challenging as well. So I'm going to run you through some of the things that we do, some of the research that we've been undertaken in the last couple of years, and a little bit about practicalities of some of the things that we do quite well, and then we can have a conversation about it. I hope that's OK. If I don't speak loudly enough, please do just shout. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of context first, maybe from um, some of the research that I've read and some of the research that I've undertaken, and put that in place in terms of some national reflections on the you know, induction transition and that whole student engagement, that umbrella that we put so many things under. We could put anything on the student engagement, I think, because the reality is that it is what we do with our students in the work that we do is, is higher education um, environment. And then try and give you a little bit of a, of a sense, a practical sense, of what our scheme looks like at the university, um, our peer mentoring scheme, and some of the things that we have been doing in this year and may do in the future as well. So I think firstly, I'd just like to contextualise some of the research that we've been doing in the last year. I do very much engage with the whole body of work that is around student engagement. I'm very much aware of the facets that promote student engagement, thinking about well-being, thinking about self-efficacy, and with that motivation, but also thinking about the human characteristics of student engagement being able to build relationships and getting involved in a space that actually is quite unfamiliar, very unfamiliar to students. So how I like to view student engagement and perhaps the student experience is as a, um, an interface. I think it's an educational interface. I think there is a whole range of plugins that the student has available to them when they join the university and how we encourage them to stick the USB in one place or plug in their power socket into another place really does then depict how well they do. Often how well they do is measured by whether they stay, whether they progress and what they exit the university with. So when I say how they engage, I mean we measure that in terms of their performance in terms of that they turn up, they stay with us and they move out of the university with a degree, hopefully, or whatever it is that they came to study in the first place. I've done a lot of work, a systematic review, um, looking at induction and transitions, too, within the, you know, under the umbrella of student engagement. I've really enjoyed reading the work, and if you haven't read some of the very early work on transition and identity and belonging, then it may be worth me spending a little time going back to some of the early work. Even um, on Gennett's work, looking at rituals in some of the um, minority groups and how they work together and create a sense of value in themselves and a sense of belonging for others, develop a sense of community. Now, Gennett's work is quite, um, it's probably marginalized by um, the types of of, of characters within his work and by the rituals that he denotes as part of his work. But when you look at it and reflect on it critically in terms of perhaps some of more, more current work like Liz Thomas's work or um, Zepke's work or Kahu's work around student engagement, the reservations are still there. All of the features around effective student engagement creating that sense of community and belonging all the way back to Gennett's work, I think. So 
I just want to position that. I do think it's um, that that student engagement induction transition. It's a typology, and I think we could make more of that as academics. I think investigating the multifaceted nature of student engagement, whether we look at it from a partnership perspective or whether we look at it from a co-creation perspective or not, as the case may be, or whether we simply look at it as a, a way of being for the students, a way of being and becoming and belonging. However we type that, those typologies can be explored and used by you as academics in a very pedagogical sense to develop your curriculum and your extracurricular to really take student engagement as far as it can go. Um, I think there's a lot of work about transformational learning and I have to say transformational learning probably sits at the heart of everything that I try to do in education. I really appreciate that our potentially neoliberal environment that we work in, forgive me if you don't believe that that is the case, or that kind of transactional culture that we are perhaps purporting to see certainly in universities such as ours really is shifting the relationship between the institution and the individual and therefore the academics and the individual as well and I really would like to very much rebel against that and I think transformative learning is the key to rebelling against the neoliberal and transactional agenda. Transformative learning if you read the work of perhaps Jack Netherill which I really like because it's very accessible and very entertaining in some ways. Um, we really tend to discover that actually it's an active process. It involves getting stuck in, plugging into the interface. And students can't do that in a transactional environment, in a neoliberal, individualistic world, that doesn't happen. So we butt against that notion and buy into the notion of transformative learning because that will be successful for our students. Rather than them just going through the process from university to get a job, a university to get qualification, actually the experience can be transformation. And I believe it should be for each student. That transformation might be different for each student, very different. But transformative it should be. Um, okay, so much has been studied and written about student engagement. And here I'm about to just blow all of my work out of the water because there is a mistake for it. There isn't a silver bullet and one size does not fit all. So I can be standing here saying these things work, but actually will they work for you? Will they work for your cohort? Will they work your own year? And the honest answer is I don't know. But what I do know is that some of the things that we've done have made a difference, a positive difference year on year. And that gives me a little assurance that perhaps we're in the right environment. But I think continuous improvement or continuous enhancement is the way forward for educational program design, extracurricular design, and the student engagement. Um, I do think that even though we've done some things very well, our times are changing already and our student body are changing, and you have to respond to that. So, in a response to this, I've been looking after and leading undergraduate and postgraduate degrees for about 12 years now across four institutions. I've got a little bit of a, um, and, and I did use the term post-92 and pre-92, and maybe you don't know what that actually is. In the UK, we have universities that um, became universities after 1992 when, when polytechnics were allowed to apply and become a university, and we have universities that have always been universities, and that's been new. And I've worked across both. Often their ethos is quite different. Uh, what we call teaching intensive universities, our pre the polytechnics, tend to be much more driven around teaching activity, curriculum design, and our pre-92 universities, the one that I currently work in, tend to be very much more research intensive. You know, really working to our students' benefit off the back that all of our educationalists are actually researchers. And by nature of their expertise in their research area, the students will get a great experience. And I'm not entirely sure that that is the case. So last year, 
I teamed up with my colleague Ruth Payne, Hal Ruth, who works at Leeds University, and we had a look at our induction, our programs generally actually, but our induction programs and our students' experience of transition, just to see what would pop up. I chose Leeds, or actually Leeds chose me because Ruth, Ruth approached them because her approach to induction and transition tends to be much more asynchronous than a lot of online resources. And our approach at um, Newcastle is very face-to-face -face human. So we just thought we'd do a bit of research and compare the two. Um, you can see here that we both probably have similar numbers of students generally. We have the same kind of academic induction. And we have a peer mentoring scheme each. What Leeds have that we don't have is an online academic skills um, what's the word? course. And I think maybe there's a lot of universities actually thinking pre-arrival or first year academic skills course online is a really good way of supporting transition and induction. So I was thinking, oh, that's really interesting because we don't have one of those, although currently Newcastle University are designing one. Um, not our program exactly, but I thought it would be worthwhile comparing and contrasting the two. So we we got involved with some of our students, as you would expect. We both recruited 15 um, stage one students randomly, and we surveyed them um, three times in the first at week one, at week six, and then at the end of first semester. And then we did focus groups with those 15 students, two focus groups, one early in the semester, one later in the semester. And what we were really looking for was just to hear their thoughts, hear about their experiences of the first semester and see how they hooked into the resources that they had available to them. In particular, looking at Leeds and their AC Prince and Newcastle and their space to position. And the findings were really interesting. We did a descriptive analysis of the surveys that we had, and we used MBIGO to help us to understand some of the focus group and work and themes that were coming from it. And there were some really interesting findings. I imagine not things that would be surprising to you at all. I'd be very surprised if they were. Um, our students arrived feeling very overwhelmed. Whether they were going to Leeds University or to Newcastle, it's an overwhelming experience. Our students talk, oh, that's like terrible. Um, I'll talk through them so that you can actually see them. They, our students described overwhelmingly across Leeds and Newcastle that the change between their previous life in education and the university life in education was so different that they couldn't make sense of them initially. And the isolation that they felt from being in everyday contact with teachers, everyday contact with friends, and everyday contact with home often was such a change and a break, actually really letting go. And if you think about Rayland's liminal spaces that you actually have to let go of something and put them into this liminal space. So I think what they were describing, um, no set structure to their life anymore, which they had before and they lost it. That sense of loss was very apparent. Um, on their own for the first time ever and only relying on a very few, a very small number of people. So that sense of loss was overwhelming. And that sense of support was underwhelming initially. And I think that's a very important bit of feedback. Um, their focus, interestingly, so from my perspective, I think my students come to Newcastle with great grades, with a passion for the subjects that they're studying, and I expect them to jump straight into it, but maybe it's no surprise. They were not interested in their subjects in these early um, conversations and these early focus groups. Actually, they couldn't focus on their studies until they had found their feet. 
I find the MEFI was not about understanding the module guide or the assessment structure for the semester. It was about understanding how they get food, where they find friends, how they socialise, how they make meaning in the space that they're in for themselves. And if somebody had done that, actually their academic study took a back seat. So some of the group stuff, her online and synchronous stuff, did not kick in for quite some time. Whereas some of the stuff we were doing in Newcastle are kicking quite early. Um, and the other overwhelming experience is that there's a comparison that the students made all the time in these surveys and in the focus group is not like it used to be. Something that's um, confusing and frustrating for them. But actually, there's something there about us making sense of it for them in the first place and helping them to understand that it's not how it used to be, but actually this is how it is and it can be really useful. And again, some of Ruth's work online and potentially was stuff that came later down the line, perhaps. So perhaps if you're thinking about an online course, then perhaps an institute is a better place to start. I'm not saying that you should, I'm just saying perhaps. Um, one of the most interesting distinctions in the analysis that we made was actually that our peer mentoring systems were very different. And that resulted in two very different experiences early on for the students. And it's actually something that when I presented the, the details of this research at Winchester, at Utrecht, and at Sheffield this year, we've interacted with the groups and the rooms around that. And what the most interesting aspect around induction transition that keeps coming up is how do you manage peer And actually, that's where I met Deirdre and Deirdre asked if we could come talk a little bit more about that. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about one of the key differences that perhaps. And Newcastle made to that early experience is through our peer mentoring system. Now, peer, this is peer mentoring, but not as you know it, I think. And I have to put my hand up and say, without Ruth Berlinger and our team, who's our teaching fellow in student engagement, this peer mentoring scheme would not work as it does. So, if anything, you need a Ruth. Mm -hmm. um, so, our scheme generally, peer mentoring, and I think this is the first important point for you to think and to feed back. Peer mentoring is a new capital university system. Every single student in first year at New Capital is required to have a peer mentor. Now we have a university peer mentor coordinator who trains um, peer mentor coordinators who sit in each school. And then how that is delivered beyond that, and they do some peer mentoring training as well, but how that's delivered beyond that is up to the school. Now, it would be fair to say that we do not, we, it's not that we have disengaged from our university-wide peer mentoring scheme, we haven't been keep in touch with them, but they do not provide our oversight or our training, we do it all ourselves. Because we feel that is the way that enables our peer mentoring scheme to be more successful than it would be without. And as a result of that, I think it would be fair to say that we have one of the most advanced peer mentoring schemes in our, in our university. Um, we have roughly 200 students a year. We only provide peer mentoring to stage one students, and we recruit around 40 peer mentors per year. Those peer mentors are made up of second, third, and fourth year students. It is a voluntary role, they are not paid. The role is advertised and our students apply and are interviewed and selected to be peer mentors. And they are trained to be peer mentors intensively before the summer of the intake that students will work in for. Um, we also have senior mentors that support those peer mentors. Our senior mentors are students that have been peer mentors themselves already. So we have them as having experience. And they are there ultimately to provide support to the peer mentors. So they have a bit of um, counseling, AA, um, I'm not sure, just you know, supervision, a uh, supervision session every couple of weeks just to make sure that they are getting the support that they need to deliver their peer mentoring to their peer mentee. 
We also all get involved as staff, so we all look after um, a senior mentor group. Actually, I don't have a senior mentor group this year. My teaching fellow in student wellbeing has taken my senior mentor groups. But the, the, the staff role within the senior mentor group is to support the, peer, the senior mentor and also to support the peer mentor as well. So as you can see, we start to build a bit of a human shape approach to supporting peer mentor. Ultimately, this support structure is so that our peer mentors feel confident and sure in terms of what their role is in terms of supporting the community, but there are limits to what they can do and actually there are boundaries to what they do as well. And I think this is a key factor as well as having a strategic overview and vision. A key factor is the support system that you build in place to keep mentoring going and going safely. Um, I think it's everyone's responsibility to peer mentoring in our university. Each peer mentor will have four or five mentees and they will meet them on a weekly basis throughout the whole of the first semester. Um, there's a structure to the work that they do. They have their activities around housing, budgeting, finding um, places to go, things to do. We expect that the, the um, mentees keep it very professional. Post Christmas the relationship is, is just relaxed a little, I think is probably the right term. They don't meet every week. The peer mentor is still there until the end of stage one, but we move from that dependent model to being a little more independent and hopefully making that transition and maybe not needing their peer mentor by the end of the year. But just in case they do meet someone at the end of stage one and into stage two our first year students are then introduced to our peer ambassadors for welfare and they are a group of students, again, who are volunteers trained, recruited and trained to support with wellbeing issues beyond stage two. That's a very interesting and whirlwind tour of our peer management system. It's been going now for seven years and I can categorically tell you that your peer mentoring will look like it's probably failing in year one and year two because until mentees, until your mentors have been mentees and then mentored and then you start to get a bit of a culture and a bit of a sense of ruling responsibility, only at that point will you start to see the benefits and the engagement I think that you need. A bit of a culture shift for students as well as a, a practice shift for us. It's a different way of working, it's labour intensive, but actually you need to wait a while to see the fruits that that means something. So don't chuck it out in the first year of my, would be my lesson learned to you, because it takes a while. But actually peer mentoring has had a, an, an amazing, well if we attribute it to, it's probably a number of things, but our retention rate has reduced significantly since we introduced this scheme and other things in 2011 to where we are now, which is we retain a lot of our students. And we not only retain our students, but our students do really, really well. They, their exit classifications are superb. And they leave agile and critically um, able students who can think across disciplines and probably transcend some of the knowledge that they have been gaining over the three years. And I don't think that's all due to peer mentoring, it's due to a number of things, including the fact that they're studying a multi-subject degree. But I do think they get up to a flying start, having somebody who has been through it already, going through it with them in the first semester. I do think it makes a difference. Um, I've already talked about most of that. I'll just give you a minute just to read. I think that's an important thing. Some of our peer mentors, and I don't know how you're thinking about establishing this as a university, or even if you are, but I think some, having something in common between the peer mentor and the peer mentee is crucial. I don't think necessarily they have to be studying the same program exactly, but there has to be a hook. You know yourself if you're to meet someone new, if you've got something in common. I mean, I went, to, I went to UKIP and didn't know anyone who went straight to speak to Deirdre because she was talking really passionately about student engagement. 
And that's the same for our students. If they find something that can hook them, then I think something in common is really important. But I don't think it has to be the same program. I think a personalised introduction to students is really important. So our peer mentors used to before our wonderful GDPR um, new guidance. They used to email the students and chat to them um, online before they came. And now we are reduced to our original method, which is sending them a letter within their welcome pack with a picture and saying who they are and reaching out to them, asking them to get in touch with them. So I think that personal contact before they arrive, and what often happens, nearly always happens actually, is that our peer mentors get a group going, either Facebook, Snapchat, whatever it is that they use nowadays. Um, and they can answer questions about, oh, do I need to bring a kettle? Do I need to do this? Who am I in a room with? Where do I take my tickets? All that thing really helps to set the tone for the landing in our city centre pub crazy campus in the middle of Newcastle. Um, I think some interesting findings from both the research that we did about, about peer mentoring but also from our stage evaluations which we undertake every year as part of our process of engaging students in their experience is um, and it's not a stage evaluation as you would expect that's delivered on the university level we do them in a very personalized way um, is that our peer mentoring scheme peaked initially to help to reduce our loss rates and actually I think it's really important for us to say that from a team perspective losing our students is not something that we want to do. I don't actually think that losing our students from a monetary perspective is the driver behind that. I think losing our students who have researched what degree program they want to study and chosen a multi-subject degree program and moved away from home and joined us in a, a strange environment at 18, I think we have a duty to them to at least try and make <coughs> them feel welcome and you know that they belong in the first place. I don't want them to leave in the first few weeks because they probably haven't given the, the course or the place enough time, but that is when we lose our students if we're going to lose them, and I don't know whether that's the case for you or not. But I would say anyone that you lose before Christmas, that actually there's probably more that you could have done in most, not all, in most cases. After Christmas, perhaps you know, kind of eight, ten weeks into understanding their environment, then perhaps they're making a much more informed choice or decision about moving. But before that, I would argue that there's probably somewhere that you have missed a, a link or a hook. I think peer mentoring helps to reduce the amount of hooks or links that you miss. Um, so it's very, our, our feedback is very positive, and even our peer mentors, 40 of them, who you would not believe how much work they put into this, this scheme, on a weekly basis organising things with mentees when they're studying perhaps their final or fourth year of their degree, is something to be really proud of, and we're really proud of our peer mentors. We wish that we could reward them more. They seem to feed back to us that actually peer mentoring is reward enough, which is very humbling. Um, we do take them out for a meal, which seems grossly inadequate, given what, that they, what they do. But we take them out for a meal just before Christmas to say thank you. But they seem to get a sense of achievement from actually doing the peer mentoring, especially those who find it quite challenging. So for those of you who say, oh, will the student even step up to doing it? I think there's potential in all our students to step up and into the breach to do this. I don't think our students are any different to yours, potentially. We do know from our, our research and from our evaluation that the areas of impact on the mentees and the mentors are these. The mentors and mentees say that they have an increased sense of belonging. Of course, the mentors look straight into the CA centre to the staff and the senior mentor support that they have. So they increase their own sense of belonging. So even if we increase 40 students' sense of belonging across stage two and three and four, that's the success. But actually our first year students say that they, they feel an increased sense of belonging as well as results of 
having an appearance of course. They get friends, even if they're not friends that they would ideally pick, it gives them a chance to have a friend until they find um, a place where they want to be. And I don't know whether you um, have come across Hugo, but it's my most favourite, favourite term. It's not researched enough, so let's do it a bit more on Hugo. But it's the Danish term for Kugu. <laughs> um, it's a real thing. <laughs> it's something that the Danish hold very dear to themselves in terms of how they and, and coziness does not interpret Huga very well. It's very difficult to interpret. But I think looking at Huga in terms of belonging and human trait is a really nice conceptualization of how it could be. Um, they also what our research, Ruth and I's research felt that found that students with their peer mentors moved on to getting down to their academic studies a little quicker. So I don't know whether that, and we haven't investigated this to say whether, because they've got that sense of belonging and they feel a little bit more confident and a little more social capital earlier on, they can then get down to their academic study. Or whether it's something else, or whether it's a peer mentor saying, oh my god, if you don't work now, you're, never good, you're going to be so far behind. And it's that sense of urgency. I'm not sure, but for some reason, students with this peer mentoring system that was working really well have gone down to their academic study more quickly. Um, I've got a list of references for you, um, but, but I'm really happy to, you know, to help you with some really focused reading if you've got a particular um, student engagement concept or theory that you're interested in because I really I just really enjoy trying to make sense of the theory and see how it works in, in the real world for us. Because I think that's the important thing, that it has to work for us in the real world and it has to work to enhance our student experience, otherwise in my view there's no point in it. And with that I think thank you. <laughs>